Good morning. Welcome to Melville. It is good to be together to worship God this morning. This morning, uh, as we gather for worship, both online and here in the sanctuary, we uh, remember those of our congregation who are um, up camping this weekend. This is our congregational camping weekend. I think they're a, um, a smaller number perhaps than usual, but certainly we keep them uh, in our minds and in our prayers this morning as they enjoy God's creation and time of fellowship together. Let us pray. God of all beginnings, we come today with praise on our lips and in our hearts. We stand in awe of all that you have created. The vast expanse of a starry night and the tiny beauty of a raindrop together reflect your glory. You have blessed creation with life and meaning. Your love makes a new beginning in us too, O oh God, in each new life born into the world, in each new friendship formed in each kindling attraction, in each kind word and act for a neighbor or stranger. We praise you, O God, for your love moving in the world around us, lived out in Jesus and by the Spirit at work in us. All praise and glory belong to you, source, savior, and spirit of love, one God, now and always. You are a God of loving kindness, and Jesus called us to love you above all else and our neighbor as ourselves. Yet we confess that we often fail to act in loving ways. We are distracted by our own needs, forgetful of the needs of others. We let differences divide us and excuse ourselves from reaching out. Forgive us, O oh God. Create in us new hearts so that we can live and love faithfully, in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, God's generous love reaches out to embrace every one of us. In Jesus, we are forgiven and set free to begin again. Let us give thanks for God's mercy and be at peace with God and with each other. Amen. As we continue through the Apostles' Creed, if nothing else, we will know it very well by the end of the summer. The faith that we affirm with these words is the faith of the whole church throughout time and space. With all of God's people, we profess our faith in the triune God, I will invite you, if you are able, to stand as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our responsive psalm this morning is Psalm 121, and we thank Ishbel for being our liturgist today. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. God will not let your foot be moved. The one who keeps you will not slumber. The one who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. 
The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. God will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Right? This is the question of the day. How can Jesus be God if Jesus is God's son? This is one of the amazing mysteries of our faith, is that when God decided to come to earth as one of us to help us understand how much God loved us, God had to have a way that we would understand to be able to see and feel and hear. And we always talk about God three in one, right? And so God sent Jesus. God became. And the way that we can understand Jesus, his relationship with God, is the way that Jesus explained his relationship with God. Jesus referred to God as his father. Jesus prayed to his father. And so we understand Jesus as God's son. But from the very, very beginning, we know that Jesus was with God and that the word was God. That's one of our scripture readings today. Jesus is the word and Jesus is God and was with God. So it's not a great way to explain. One of the fabulous things about our faith, though, is that we can't explain everything. Even the Apostle Paul, who is responsible for so much of what we find in the New Testament, says right now we only see a little bit, but eventually we will see more and understand more. And it may not be today and it may not be in this life, but we know that someday we will understand. And for today, we have to have trust and faith in what God has shown us so far. Let's pray. We're gonna pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, which starts off with our Father. Jesus says, no one goes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. As we come to hear God's word, mighty and mysterious as it often is, let's pray that the Holy Spirit would help us to understand. O oh God, our trustworthy teacher of truth, by your spirit reveal your will for us in the reading of your word. Stir in our hearts and minds and strengthen us to respond in faithfulness. Amen. We have two gospel readings today. The first one is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. And you can see the page number printed on your uh, screen. Hear the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. 
He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent or of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And our second gospel reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 28. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, you must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good would it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with the angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Uh, Kind of walk us through the Apostles' Creed this summer. I initially broke it all down and realized that we could do this between now and Advent and maybe maybe get there um, in terms of actually being able to give it the time that it was due. Um, So I will confess that there will be more questions possibly than answers as we work our way through the Apostles' Creed this summer, but I hope that it gives each of us an opportunity to engage with these ancient words of our faith and to begin to get comfortable with the questions that they raise. Uh, There is so much in so so many blessings in being able to say, I don't understand, Holy Spirit, help me understand. And so many wonderful places we can go 
and conversations we can have to learn more. And so here we are, week two, and we are already past, I believe, in God the Father Almighty. And um, in the simplest of divisions, the creed walks us through the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so um, the way I've broken it up has us spending the bulk of our time on everything that comes after, I believe, in the Holy Spirit. Because those pieces, I think, we sometimes take for granted, but also overlook them because they're not as obvious, perhaps, as those first three um, sections. And so today... Uh, we are looking at all 10 lines, I believe, in Jesus Christ. Um, it's not nearly enough time to do it justice, but it, it, the, what we believe about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the framework for everything else. So we do our best. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, buried, descended, rose, ascended, seated with the Father, coming again. As far as biographies go, it is an impressive one. But interestingly, this multitude of mile markers, if you will, in Jesus' life and beyond, actually skips over almost every story that we know about Jesus. Beyond the ones that have come to shape what we now consider the church year, from Advent to Christmas to Good Friday and Pontius Pilate to Easter Sunday and the Resurrection and on to the Ascension. These 10 brief lines, though, bracketed by God the Creator and the gift of the Holy Spirit, offer us the story of our salvation. All of the stories about Jesus that we love to hear so much and which are so important and essential to our lives as followers of Jesus aren't here in the creed. And partially, I assume, for the sake of brevity, but I think more significantly, because all of those stories don't have a lot of meaning without the framework of who Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior, was and is and will become. If Jesus is just a guy from Galilee who lived a good moral life and show us how to love, then that's great. But it's not enough. There's lots of great moral guys and girls. When we say that we believe in Jesus, we need to believe that that life, those stories, everything that happens in the Gospels that we read and proclaim, everything that happened between his birth and his crucifixion matters and stands as an example to us all because Jesus is God's only Son, our Lord, part of the Trinity, God's Son, and yes, God himself with God and in the beginning, not only with God, as John's gospel reminds us, but God himself. Our reading from Matthew today wastes no time in getting to the point. Jesus gets to Caesarea Philippi, a Ro Roman stronghold, essentially Caesarville, if you will, and he turns to his friends and asks, who do people say that I am? And we'll come back to why that is such a loaded question in that context in a little bit. But for now, take a moment to think how you might answer that same question. Who do people say that Jesus is? How can it be that Jesus is God's son and also God? I feel sorry for Sunday school teachers that end up with all the PKs in the class. Uh, what does the world know about Jesus? Probably a better question is, what does the world think they know about Jesus? What does the church tell the world about Jesus? 
What do we tell ourselves and what do we tell our children? Who do you say that Jesus is? At the outset, it seems like explaining who Jesus is should be the easiest thing in the world. There are many stories to tell, relatable stories, likable stories, miraculous stories. I mean, sure, he was countercultural enough at the time that he was probably not the one you'd want to bring home to meet the folks. Um, he was maybe not the obvious mentor who people would choose for their teen or young adult. But on the balance, there's not a whole lot to dislike and a fair bit about Jesus that seems relatable, approachable, likable, friend-like. But when we really get into it and try to describe the significance of who Jesus is in the context of our faith and in our life and in the life of the church, we find fairly quickly that it is one thing to talk about all of the ways that Jesus showed love, how Jesus demonstrates a high moral standard. Even how Jesus died on the cross out of love for us seems easy enough to explain because we understand, at least in theory, what the, this idea of taking something to save another. But it's another thing altogether to begin to frame those somewhat more understandable realities within the whole picture of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus as God. Now, if you had to answer that question using scripture, who do you say that Jesus is, and you had to choose between today's readings to introduce someone to Jesus, I think you'd find that neither of these are the ones you're reaching for. Um, but on the balance, <laughs> you may be more likely to choose Jesus' discussion with his disciples because it is a conversation and he seems more human in it, um, even though it's still a little bit odd, to John's more poetic renderings, uh, which you might choose to leave for another time. John is beautiful, but it's a little bit tricky to work your way through without knowing and adding significant portions of the gospel as you go. Left on our own, we might be more likely to pick a miracle, a healing, a feeding, a thoughtful conversation, the Sermon on the Mount even. These are just, there are just so many great scriptural opportunities to talk about what a great guy Jesus is. And I think that for many of us, that would be our inclination to start with Jesus, as man, Jesus, and what he did, and what he showed, and what he demonstrated. Interestingly, that is not what the Apostles' Creed or the creeds in general are interested in. More in the line of John's, in the beginning was the word, which that whole chapter, I can't not hear the, some of the great chants that have been written on that chapter. The creed reminds us, without any flourish or embellishment, who and what Jesus is. It proclaims the fullness of Jesus' divinity and the fullness of his humanity. He is Lord, only Son of God, but he was born and made man. He lived and he died very human things, and then he rose and he ascended very divine things. And perhaps most forgotten is the part where he was there with God before the world even began. When we proclaim that we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, we stand on a very narrow balance beam of describing one who is both fully human and fully divine at the same time. We proclaim that we believe that Jesus, the word of God, God himself, and a man who walked and talked and died a very real death are all the same person at all the same time. And so it turns out that who do you say that I am is a very, very loaded question. On the one hand, we can overemphasize his divinity, 
talking about the miracles and the superhuman events and the characteristics of Jesus that are like God. On the other hand, we can overemphasize Jesus' humanity, ignoring or devaluing everything that scripture says that points to his divinity in an effort to make him very relatable. We are called as people of faith, as disciples of Jesus, as ones who follow, to hold both intention at all times, to truly begin to understand and articulate the significance of everything that Jesus is for us. But I want to go back to Jesus and the disciples in Caesarea Philippi, and you have to know that Jesus doesn't ask this question in any old place. Around 20 BC, 10 or 15 years before Jesus was born, Augustus had given the town and its surrounding region to King Herod, yes, that King Herod, and Herod had built up the city, including a white marble temple that honored the cult of Augustus Caesar. Caesarea Philippi. When Herod died, uh, the town passed to King Philip, Philippi, um, and it became a place filled with all of the trappings of Rome and all of the political patronages that went with it. It was a place of influence and opulence. And so it is not a place for someone to go around advertising that they were the Messiah that the Jews were waiting for. Not the Messiah, not a place that you want to suddenly be proclaiming that you are the Messiah that had Herod so scared he ordered the execution of all the babies only three decades earlier. That town was a symbol of everything that the Jews expected the Messiah to overthrow. And it is there that Jesus decides to turn to his friends and say, Who do you say that I am? And so Peter's answer is a political shot across the bow, if there ever was one. And he's the only one gutsy enough to take it. The others are more confident in answering, who do other people say that, you, that I am, you know, the prophets? And they had a point, that is what people were saying, but not Peter. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, he says. Pick a context either contemporary or ancient, and there are any number of ways this statement could be received. Here today, in our comfortable Western context, it seems pretty normal. Even if people don't believe it, they understand the statement. But in places where Christians suffer persecution, it is a life-threatening assertion. And there, in Caesarea Philippi, it had the potential to be the spark that ignited a whole revolution. But Jesus says, yeah, but don't tell anyone. There are any number of reasons that Jesus may have given that instruction. But think about where they are. Think about this context. That statement in that place ran the risk of sweeping Jesus' mission up into all of the pomp and circumstance and earthly splendor, all of the politics that was never part of the plan, but was exactly what the world was waiting for. It's not about power and privilege. This now quasi-secret that Peter confesses and Jesus says has been or revealed to him by God is the foundation on which the church was established. It is a life-changing truth, but it's not a truth that is going to compete with the marble palaces of the emperor. Knowing who Jesus really is, the son of the living God, means that no matter how modest the church may look in any given time or place, no matter how imperfect the church will always be, see Peter's later refusal to believe that Jesus would die and his later denials of even knowing him, despite all that we believe, in a power that outstrips the the political powers of the world. The church was never meant to be what they were expecting it to be, and so Jesus says, don't tell anyone, because that would have sent it in a whole other direction. 
we believe in a power that outstrips the political powers of the world, does not overthrow them, but outstrips them. We believe in a power that no one and nothing in the universe, not even death on a cross, can stop. It is important for us to hear Jesus draw attention to his full identity, hum humanity and divinity, in the shadow of the powers of the world, because the world will always try to convince us that earthly power wins, that our faith, our church, is only meaningful, is only strong, is only honoring to God when we are in control of the world's narrative when we get to define the practices and the policies around us. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> we are, as disciples, called to play a role. We are called to actively work and advocate and learn and, and be involved in things like harm reduction and reconciliation and, and learning and service and mission and love and forgiveness. We are called to work and to advocate and to live faithfully calling others to do the same, working for the good of creation, sharing the good news. But our success in doing those things as a church, as the body of Christ, as individual disciples, is not defined by how important the world thinks we are. We cannot allow ourselves to be measured by earthly standards. If that were what we were going for, you have to imagine that the conversation surrounding Peter's confession would have gone quite differently than it did. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. This was not a call to arms, but a call to root ourselves in the truth of who Jesus is. This is the foundation on which the church is built, Jesus says. Fully human, fully divine. When we make the mistake of thinking of Jesus as only divine, we miss the parts of the story where Jesus is human, his birth, his temptations, the grief at the death of his friend, the suffering he endured on the cross. Affirming and believing in the humanity of Jesus reminds us that God is accessible, that God chose to dwell among us as one of us. Jesus reminds us that our humanity is sacred and that we are each made in God's image. In Jesus' humanity, the word of God speaks our language and gives us a model of love around which to shape our lives. But that's not all of the story. If the Christian story is about emulating the life of Jesus, then we are doomed for failure. If our salvation is dependent on how well we follow him, then we don't stand a chance. If our, if our redemption is based on our ability to love and forgive our worst enemies, to stand in the middle of a political firestorm and resist the urge to say, hey, he's here, the Messiah, Jesus is going to take you all down, we're going to rule the world, then the world has already won. That's not good news, because even the best of us fall into sin. Even the most righteous and loving among us do not allow for Jesus' vision of love to shape our every thought and our every action all of the time. I refer you again to Peter, the rock, who doesn't want his friend to die, yet also believes him to be the Messiah. Only Jesus, fully divine, can rescue us from ourselves and from the appealing promise of power that the world offers us. How much self-control must it have taken the disciples not to shout Jesus' identity from the rooftops in the face of Roman oppressors? On the other hand, how much did their human fear of death help in their restraint? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. The creeds tell the story of our salvation, recognizing that that is what we need above all else, and it is something we cannot attain for ourselves. It is something that we cannot match. To believe in Jesus is to remember that it is out of God's love for us and that all of this happened. 
Even though we may not understand every single part of it and may never understand all of it on this side of eternity. But we believe that the word of God came to that which was his own and that even though the world did not want anything to do with him, he lived, died, and rose again. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We are so, so very loved that God sent his only son to live, um, son to live among us, to suffer among us, to die among us, so that we could dwell with him so that we could rejoice with him, so that we would have the right to claim our identity as God's beloved children and be truly free of all of the world's expectations, anxiety, and fear. So every time we recite the creed, every time we say the words, I believe in Jesus Christ and everything that follows, we proclaim the fullness of Jesus' identity, hum human and divine. We remind ourselves and each other of the hope that we have as Christians, as Christ followers. We remind ourselves that our value is not found in the power that we hold over the world, but in how beloved we are in the eyes of God. And that that transforming love is what has the ultimate power to change and transform all of creation. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundant growth, as summer unfolds around us, we give you thanks for warm, sunny days, for beauty in our gardens, for crops growing in the fields, for swimming in oceans and lakes and pools. Where the abundance of nature is at risk, we pray that your spirit will work in and through us to restore air, water, and soil for the good of all creation. We pray for places suffering famine and drought, deforestation, wildfire, those things which place human life in danger and which tend to bring out the worst in all of us. Lord, help us to see the ways that you call us to respond and serve. God of peace and reconciliation, we thank you for the peace and freedom that we enjoy and for the many ways that our lives are protected on this land. We remember before you those places torn apart by violence and hatred, those people who face discrimination daily. And we pray for all who feel unsafe, Lord, we pray remembering and giving thanks that while we, for many of us, this is a safe and protected country and community, that there are others for whom that is not the case. We pray for those who suffered generational traumas of so many kinds. Pray that you would continue to help us to enter into relationships with those who are not like us with spirits of curiosity and understanding, but most of all, love. We pray that you might inspire leaders in every country to lead with your wisdom and mercy. Guide them in your ways of peace and justice. God of creativity and community, we thank you for the many ways that the church can and does serve you in Jesus' name. Thank you for the unique voices that sing your praise and speak your comfort, even in the most uncomfortable and unlikely places. We give thanks for all of the hands that share in acts of service, for the prayers that are offered quietly and faithfully for your will to be done. We pray for the church and for its many congregations as we all seek to be faithful. Help us to work together so that our unity bears witness to the possibilities for unity among diverse peoples everywhere. God of every precious life, our hearts ache for those who are suffering, for those who are sick in mind, body, and spirit. Hear our prayers as we name before you those in need of your love and healing in the silence of our hearts. God of hope and love, draw us closer to you every day. Show us what you desire for us. 
and inspire our faithfulness in the example of Jesus, the Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and forevermore. Amen.